As we journey back in time to explore the origins of the Great Wall, it's imperative to comprehend the period of individual walls. During the Zhou Dynasty, separate states erected their own barriers as protection measures. These walls, constructed from readily available materials such as rammed earth and wood, were primarily designed to fend off and raids from neighboring states and wandering tribes. This epoch highlighted the start of what would later evolve into the Great Wall. While these separate barriers were not as grandiose or extensive as the Great Wall we're familiar with today, they played a pivotal role in molding the idea of a unified defensive network. The call for unity and safeguard against common foes laid the groundwork for the development of a Great Wall, a notion that would be fulfilled centuries later under the command of Emperor Qin Shi Huang during the Qin Dynasty. Emperor Qin commanded the linkage of these existing walls and the erection of new sections to ward off northern conquerors. It wasn't until the Ming Dynasty, spanning from the 14th to the 17th century, that the Great transformed into its present form. Indeed, these primitive walls served as the precursors, the initial stages that led to the creation of an emblem of unity and endurance that continues to marvel the globe. As we delve deeper into the origins of the Great Wall, it's crucial to understand the era of fragmented walls. Individual states during the Zhou Dynasty erected separate walls using rudimentary materials like rammed earth and timber. The motivation behind these structures was to shield themselves from attacks and invasions by neighboring states and wandering tribes. These fragmented barriers laid the groundwork for the idea of a cohesive fortification system which eventually took shape as the Great Wall. These early fortifications represented the initial stages towards crafting an enduring symbol of unity and resolve that continues to captivate the global audience. The notion of a unified wall didn't materialize until the Qin Dynasty under Emperor Qin Shi Huang's reign in the 3rd century BC. With his eyes set on a consolidated China, Qin commanded the joining of existing barriers and the erection of new sections to counter northern marauders. The task was labor-intensive and claimed countless human lives. Regardless, the outcome was a formidable defensive structure stretching across thousands of miles, serving as an early emblem of a united China. The Han Dynasty continued the tradition, pushing the wall further into the western frontiers. However, the Great Wall as we know it today took shape during the Ming Dynasty from the 14th to the 17th century. The Ming emperors, under the constant threat from Mongols, embarked on a colossal project to fortify and lengthen the Great Wall. Instead of rammed earth, bricks and stones were used, making the wall stronger and more durable. Beacon towers and watchtowers were added, serving as communication points and living quarters for soldiers. The Ming Great Wall, stretching over 5,500 miles, became the most robust military defense system of its time. Fast forward to the present day, the Great Wall stands as a symbol of China's historical resilience and architectural prowess. It is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, attracting millions of tourists from around the world each Imagine a place so grand, so majestic that it spans over 7 million square feet, housing nearly 10,000 rooms. A place of such historical significance that it was the home of 24 Chinese emperors over five centuries. This is no imaginary realm, but the majestic Forbidden City in Beijing, China. In the heart of Beijing, the Forbidden City began its life in the early 15th century during the reign of the Yongle Emperor of the Ming Dynasty. A testament to the Emperor's ambition, the construction of the Forbidden City took 14 years and more than a million workers. The result was a grand palace complex that would serve as the political and ceremonial center of Chinese government for centuries to come. The Forbidden City was so named because it was off-limits to the general public. Only the Emperor, his immediate family, his women and thousands of eunuchs had the privilege to witness its splendor from the inside. Violating this sanctity was a crime punishable by death. The architecture of the Forbidden City is a marvel of traditional Chinese design. Its layout, a perfect example of Chinese cosmology, reflects the harmony of the universe. The buildings, painted in the imperial colors of yellow and red, are adorned with intricate carvings and designs, each telling a story of its own. Over the centuries, the Forbidden City has witnessed the rise and fall of dynasties. It has seen the transition from the Ming Dynasty to the Qing Dynasty, 
and finally the end of imperial rule with the establishment of the Republic of China in 1912. Despite the tumultuous changes, the Forbidden City stood firm, a silent observer of China's past. Today, the Forbidden City, renamed the Palace Museum, stands as a symbol of China's rich history. It houses an extensive collection of artifacts, over a million pieces of art and cultural relics, each piece a key to unlocking the vast and complex history of China. In the span of seven minutes, we have journeyed through five centuries of history. We've walked through the grand halls of the Forbidden City, touched upon its architectural marvels, and delved into its historical significance. We've learned about the emperors who called it home, and the dynasties it has seen rise and fall, and finally we've explored its current role as the Palace Museum, a treasured trove of Chinese culture and history. The Forbidden City, a place of grandeur, majesty and history, stands as a testament to China's past and a beacon for its future. A place of such significance cannot be fully encapsulated in words or in a brief span of time. It is a living, breathing embodiment of China's rich and vibrant history, a symbol of its past and a guidepost for its future. The dawn of the third century. BCE saw the rise of a powerful figure in China, a man whose ambition knew no bounds, Emperor Qin Shi Huang. His reign marked the beginning of the Qin dynasty, a time of great unification and expansion. But perhaps his most enduring legacy lies not in the annals of history, but beneath the earth, a silent army standing guard over his final resting place. This is the story of the Terracotta Army, a monumental testament to a ruler's desire for immortality. Picture a time when China, as we know it today, was divided into warring states. Qin Shi Huang, then known as Ying Zheng, ascended to the throne of the Qin state at the tender age of 13. Through a combination of military might and political cunning, he managed to unify these fragmented territories into one empire, thus earning the title Qin Shi Huang, or the first emperor of Qin. Yet, even as he ruled over this vast empire, Qin Shi Huang was consumed by a fear of death and a quest for immortality. This obsession led him to commission the construction of a grand mausoleum, a project that would take an estimated 700,000 workers and span almost four decades. The centerpiece of this mausoleum? The Terracotta Army, a force of over 8,000 life-sized warriors, chariots and horses, each painstakingly crafted from clay. Remarkably, no two figures are the same. Each warrior boasts unique facial features, hairstyles and attire, reflecting the diverse origins of the soldiers in the Emperor's real army. Buried alongside the Emperor, this clay army was meant to protect him in the afterlife, ensuring his rule extended beyond the realm of the living. But for over two millennia, the Terracotta Army lay forgotten, buried beneath layers of earth and time, until a chance discovery in the spring of 1974. Farmers digging a well in the Xi'an region stumbled upon fragments of terracotta. Little did they know, they had uncovered one of the greatest archaeological finds of the 20th century. Excavations revealed the full extent of the Emperor's mausoleum, a vast necropolis complete with palaces, offices and the famed terracotta army. Today the terracotta army stands as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a testament to China's rich history and the enduring legacy of its first emperor. With every figure that is unearthed, we gain new insights into the Qin dynasty, from its military tactics to its artistic practices. In summary, the terracotta army is more than just an archaeological marvel. It is a window into the past, a reflection of an emperor's ambition and a symbol of China's ancient glory. From its creation under the reign of Qin Shi Huang to its discovery in the 20th century, the Terracotta Army continues to captivate and intrigue, a silent sentinel bearing witness to the passage of time. And so, the Terracotta Army stands ever vigilant, a testament to a bygone era and a monument to an emperor's quest for immortality. As we delve into the annals of history, we can only marvel at the grandeur of this clay army, a testament to the human spirit's capacity for creativity, ambition, and the enduring desire to leave a mark on the sands of time.
Ever pondered upon the sheer majesty and tranquility that nature bestows upon us? Ever wondered how these landscapes shape our cultures, histories, and lives? Today we delve into one such marvel of nature, the Li River and the city of Gulin in China, which have been a cradle of culture and a muse for poets and painters for centuries. The Li River, also known as Lijiang, is a gem of China's abundant natural beauty. Originating in the Maur Mountains in Xing'an County, it flows for about 437 kilometers, passing through Gilin, Yangshuo, Pingle, and finally into the West River, a tributary of the mighty Pearl River. This river, with its crystal clear waters, is surrounded by mesmerizing karst mountains, which are a stunning example of the incredible phenomenon that occurs when soluble rocks like limestone erode over thousands of years. These mountains, with their unusual shapes and sizes, have given rise to numerous legends and folktales, making them an integral part of the local culture. Gilin, a city on the banks of the Li River, is as enchanting as the river itself. Its name translates to Forest of Sweet Osmanthus, owing to the large number of fragrant osmanthus trees found in the city. Gilin, with its history dating back to over 10,000 years, has seen the rise and fall of numerous dynasties, each leaving its mark on the city's culture and architecture. The city is home to numerous historical sites such as the Jingjiang Prince City, a Ming Dynasty palace complex, and the Sun and Moon Pagodas, two connected pagodas symbolizing the balance of yin and yang. The Li River and Galin are not just about the scenic beauty and historical sites, they are also about the people and their way of life. The traditional fishing villages along the Lai River offer a glimpse into a way of life that has remained unchanged for centuries. The fishermen, with their gaslit lanterns and tamed cormorants, are a sight to behold as they skillfully catch fish in the river, reflecting a symbiotic relationship with nature. In conclusion, the Li River and Gilin are a testament to the awe-inspiring beauty of nature and the rich tapestry of culture and history. They encapsulate the serenity of the karst mountains, the tranquility of the winding waterways, and the vibrancy of the traditional fishing villages. They offer unforgettable river cruises and scenic hikes, providing a unique blend of natural beauty and cultural heritage. So, the next time you yearn for an experience that transcends the ordinary, remember the Li River and Guilin, where nature and culture intertwine in a mesmerizing dance of harmony. Have you ever wondered how a city can effortlessly blend centuries of history with the cutting-edge future? Welcome to Shanghai, a city where the past and the future coexist, not just side by side, but interwoven in its very fabric. And nowhere is this more apparent than at the Bund, Shanghai's historic waterfront. The Bund, or Weitan as it's known in Mandarin, is a stretch of colonial-era buildings lining the western bank of the Huangpu River. It dates back to the mid-19th century when Shanghai was a treaty port. This was a time when foreign powers were allowed to establish their own enclaves in China, leading to an influx of Western architecture and influence. The buildings that stand tall on the Bund today are the remnants of that era. They are grandiose, ornate, and reflect a wide range of architectural styles, from Gothic and Baroque to neoclassical. They once housed banks, consulates, and trading houses from the United Kingdom, the United States, France, Italy, Russia, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Today, they are home to high-end restaurants, luxury boutiques, and art spaces. But turn your gaze across the river, and you'll find a stark contrast. The Pudong skyline, studded with futuristic skyscrapers, represents the new Shanghai. It's a testament to China's rapid economic growth and its embrace of modernity. The iconic Oriental Pearl Tower, the spiraling Shanghai Tower, and the bottle-opener-shaped Shanghai World Financial Center are hard to miss. The Bund, in its essence, symbolizes Shanghai's blend of old and new. It's a place where history is not forgotten but celebrated. It's a place where the future is not feared but embraced. It's a place where the old world charm of the colonial buildings and the modern allure of the skyscrapers coexist in a harmonious balance. It's a place that tells the tale of Shanghai, a city that has seen the rise and fall of empires, the ebb and flow of fortunes, and the constant march of progress. It's a place that embodies the spirit of Shanghai, 
a city that respects its past, lives in the present, and looks towards the future. In today's journey, we've delved into the history and significance of the Bund, Shanghai's historic waterfront. We've explored how it symbolizes Shanghai's blend of old and new, a testament to a city that marries its rich history with a forward-thinking mindset. From the colonial-era buildings that echo the city's past, to the futuristic skyscrapers that hint at its future, the Bund is a microcosm of Shanghai itself. So, the next time you find yourself pondering the seamless blend of the old and the new, remember the Bund, remember Shanghai, a city that teaches us that the past and the future are not mutually exclusive, but rather, two sides of the same coin.